This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're joined by Ethan Nadelman, founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. He's joining us from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where he's attending the World Economic Forum's regional Latin America meeting, but here to talk about the significance of this um, meeting that has taken place, the Summit of the Americas, in Cartagena, Colombia. We're also joined by Greg Garandon of uh, New York University, Latin American history professor there. Ethan Nadelman. The significance of President Obama's stance um, against decriminalization or any kind of legalization of drugs, the position he's taken on drug policy, and the leaders in Latin America, what they have said in response. Well, I would not put that much significance into President Obama saying he's opposed to legalization or decriminalization. That's sort of the standard pattern one expects it from the politicians. They've been scared of their own shadows on this issue for a very long time. But what's much more important, Amy, is sort of looking at the tea leaves and all this stuff, because that's why this summit is even notwithstanding the nuance of the comments that was that were made is really going to go down in a sort of historic way in terms of the transformation of the regional and global dialogue around drug policy. This is the first time ever that you've had a president and for that matter a vice president saying this is a legitimate subject of discussion, the decriminalization, legalization. This is the first time you've had a president saying that we're willing to look at the possibility that US drug policies are doing more harm than good in some parts of the world. So then you have the other other leaders in the region. President Santos is, you know, as was just said before, an important ally of the United States, the former defense minister under President Uribe, somebody with a lot of credibility in waging a drug war. And he's very focused on opening this up. And he's not, no, you know, Time magazine has him on the cover this week as the emerging Latin American leader of significance. Otto Perez Molina is very focused. Laura Chichia, the president of Costa Rica, came away saying she was very pleased that the Central American nations were benefiting because of the opening of this discussion. You have the funny situation of Evo Morales, the leftist leader of Bolivia, former head of the Coca Growers Union, lecturing the United States about essentially sounding like Milton Friedman that how can you expect us to reduce the supply when there is a demand? So there's the beginning of a change here. I don't think it's going to be possible to put this genie back in the bottle. Mexico's President Felipe Calderon renewed calls on the United States, the world's largest market for illegal drugs, to do more to curb consumption as well. Consumer countries, generally the United States, should make a bigger effort to reduce consumption and consequently the extraordinary flow of economic resources that goes into the hands of the criminals. And of course, the Colombian president himself, as you mentioned, Santos, I mean, who's been the recipient of millions in uh, drug war money, still coming out for decriminalization, Ethan Edelman. Well, you know, it's an interesting time for President Calderon. I mean, his term ends later this year. He has waged the war on drugs for a long time. He's pointing his finger at the United States and saying, why don't you reduce your demand and stop sending so many guns down our way? Uh, you know, at the summit, he expresses appreciation for new organized crime agreements. But at the same time, he's also floating and supporting this new discussion. When he was in the United States last year traveling around, he started saying if the U.S. cannot reduce its demand for illegal drugs, it's time for it to investigate, quote-unquote, market alternatives, which was seen correctly as code word for legal alternatives. His foreign minister, Patricia Espinosa, in February said that now Mexico does, in fact, support a debate about the legalization issue. So the real question, I think, with Calderon is in the extended period in which he's a lame duck after the election in July, but before he leaves office in December, will he speak out? Will he make an effort to speak more boldly in the way that Santos and Otto Perez Molina are right now? And the other question is, his likely successor, Peña Nieto, coming from the old pre-party, the one that dominated Mexican politics for something like seven decades, the general thought has been that he just wants to sort of put all this, go back to the old understanding between government and gangsters that pre-modeled for so many years. But as one former president, Cesar Gaviria, said to me recently, when somebody becomes president, they're faced with a new situation. So the new president of Mexico come next year is going to have to decide, does he want to let this whole debate dwindle? Does he want to just keep suffering the consequences of a failed U.S. policy? Or does he want to actively participate in the initiatives of Santos, Otto Perez Molina, Chinchilla, and others? And what about the fact that this is an election year, Ethan Edelman? 
Well, it simply means that uh, you're not going to hear much of this in U.S. politics. I'll be curious to see whether Fox News or Romney's campaign try to pick on Obama, even for the modest acknowledgments he made. But the interesting thing, of course, Amy, on this issue is that this is very much an issue that's of the left and the right. As was said before, some of the leading proponents of drug policy reform in the region are coming from the right and the center-right, both the current president, Santos and Otto Perez Molina, but also former presidents like Cardoso Gaviria and Zedillo from Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, who were the ones who spearheaded these important global commissions that helped open up the issue. In the United States, you know, the two lions of uh, the conservative movement in the late 20th century, William Buckley and Milton Friedman. It's in the Republican pri Party primaries where you hear libertarians like Ron Paul and Gary Johnson talking to this issue. You know, it's people like former Secretary of State George Shultz or Frank Carlucci who are clearly opposed to the drug war. It's Grover Norquist, the uh, anti-tox partisan who's very much a committed opponent of the drug war. So this is very much a bipartisan issue. We're not going to see the same sorts of sniping from left and right on this issue as on others. And I think that means that this debate is going to go stronger and more bolder as a result. Professor Greg Grandin, the alarming rate of drug-related violence in Central America that um, all are um, trying to deal with. Yeah, I mean, it's a direct consequence of Clinton's plan, Colombia, which has telegraphed the violence up through up from Colombia through Central America. It had the effect of breaking up the transportation cartels, but did little about production or consumption. So therefore, just increased the, the incentive for cartels and gangs in Central America. This was a moment when these, these countries were coming out of these devastating civil wars, just trying to put their institutions, civil institutions, back together again. It was like a tsunami. And added to that was the, was the disruptions and dislocations of neoliberalism, first NAFTA and then the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which just created massive dislocation in the countryside and destroyed agrarian markets and, and just, uh, you know, both both created this void and vacuum that, that the drug violence filled. I mean, these are these are really the two legacies of the Clinton administration. I'm a little bit a little bit more pessimistic about the United States' ability to respond to this. I mean, you know, the United States, what we're seeing, what's 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 at play, what you see at the Summit of the America is really an international forum, foreign policy forum, that what's on view is domestic political sclerosis. So all, the three things the U.S. could do to, in, to improve its situation and its relationship with Latin America, Cuba, normalize relations with Cuba, uh, uh, humanize its drug policy, and, and three, and, um, and then have um, a, a more kind of humane trade policy. What, what stops that is, it, oh, and then also immigration, so four things, is, is domestic politics. I mean, we always have an election in the United States. There's always short-term interests that mitigate any uh, against a rational long-term response, but then there's also deep interests within the United States. There's the military-industrial complex, which makes a lot of money on the drug war. There's Southcom, whose whole reason for existence is the drug war in, in Latin America. I mean, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be. It's going to take a lot to kind of pry those interests off of, off of this off of this uh, um, this 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 policy and, and lead to a more rational response. I think. Uh, Ethan Nadelman, you're speaking to us now, not from Cartagena, but from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, where um, uh, you are there for the World Economic Forum uh, regional meeting. The significance of this uh, following Cartagena right now? Well, it was, uh, it was planned before people knew that this was going to be on the issue of the Summit of the Americas. But I'll be on a panel in a few days with the uh, President of Guatemala, Otto Perez Molina, with the uh, Assistant Secretary of State in the U.S. for law enforcement matters and narcotics, William Brownfield, and with the Mexican Interior Minister, whose job it is to wage the drug war. So it's notable that in a forum like this, which mostly focuses on business issues, that this issue is on the agenda. It's consistent, however, with the fact that you now see the legal business communities in places like Mexico City, Monterey, Guatemala City, beginning to step up and say, this isn't working. And I should also just say, I, mean, I agree with the previous speaker, this is going to be a very difficult to sort of bring this, keep this discussion going in an above ground way. Uh, you know, there is a prison industrial complex. There are vested interests and powerful bureaucracies that have spent decades trying to suppress and ignore this discussion. Uh, already, the U.S. is trying to find ways to maneuver this discussion into places where it'll get stuck in sor sorts of qu intellectual quagmires and go nowhere. But I think that, on the other hand, People like Santos, Otto Perez Molina, and others are savvy enough and are investing enough of time and their own energy to keep this thing moving, to understand that civil society, the intellectuals, the drug policy experts need to be engaged. And then if we just turn this over to, uh, to, to, to the, the government's drug czars or their foreign ministries, this thing will die. That's where the U.S. wants it. The others know it has to expand out for it to be effective. 
I want to thank you both very much for being with us, Ethan Nadelman of the Drug Policy Alliance, speaking to us from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and Greg Grandin, uh, teaches Latin American history at New York University, author of Empire's Workshop, Latin America and the United States and the Rise of the New Imperialism, and Fort Langa, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, uh, the debate raging in uh, election politics now about women's work in the workplace, both outside and inside the homes.